evidences for believing in God, believing in the Bible, believing in Jesus are the many, many fulfilled prophecies contained in the Bible. Let's open up our Bibles this morning to Isaiah chapter 46. Because God makes this claim in Isaiah 46 that there is no one like him. No one can tell the future like God does. Isaiah 46 verse 9. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Let's notice that at the end of verse 9. No one like God. And why is that in particular? Verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done. There's no one like God who can predict the future, who knows the future, who can predict it and have it precisely fulfilled as time goes on. In fact, if we go back a couple of chapters in Isaiah to Isaiah chapter 41, God, uh, through the prophet, is addressing idols, as it were, or idol worshippers, and he's throwing down a challenge to them. Isaiah 41, let's read from verse 21. Present your case, the Lord says. Bring forward your strong arguments. The king of Jacob says, let them bring forth and declare to us what is going to take place. Now, can you see that challenge there? If these idols and uh, these idol worshippers have any power, well, let them tell us what's going to take place. As for the former events, declare what they were, that we may consider them and know their outcome. Or announce to us what is coming. There it is again. If you've got power, tell us what's coming in the future. Verse 23, declare the things that are going to come afterward. Of course, the idols couldn't do this. They're nothing but stone and wood and so on. The idol worshippers couldn't do this. And so we read on here, uh, Isaiah goes on to say, Declare the things, verse 23, that are going to come afterward, that we may know that you are gods. Indeed, do good or evil. Do anything that we may anxiously look about us and fear together. And then, of course, the conclusion in verse 24, Behold, you are of no account, and your work amounts to nothing, and he who chooses you is an abomination. God throws down the challenge to all, you see. If you've got power, predict the future. God has done it many, many times, hundreds of times, and it's been fulfilled in the Bible. That's why we can trust the Bible as God's word. That's why we can believe in uh, uh, God. And that's why we can believe in Jesus. These prophecies have been fulfilled. And there are hundreds and hundreds of prophecies in the Bible that have been fulfilled. But today I'd only like to consider a portion of them. And the portion I'd like to consider are prophecies of resurrection prophecies of resurrection and even the prophecies of resurrection we're not going to consider all of those we're only going to consider some of these so let's begin this morning with our first point and let's notice that Jesus resurrection was prophesied and let's begin by going right back a thousand years about a thousand years before the time of Jesus ministry and let's have a couple of, uh, look at a couple of these prophecies about his coming resurrection. Let's open up to Psalm 16, first of all. Now, if you look at the superscription of Psalm 16, you'll see that this is a miktam of David. And David, we know, lived about a thousand years before the time of Jesus. If we skip down to verse 10... In this psalm, David writes, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. And we might ask, as the eunuch did on a separate occasion, uh, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or someone else? That he won't stay dead, that he won't undergo decay. Who's the prophet speaking about? Who's David speaking about here? Well, the answer, of course, is found in Acts chapter 2. Let's turn over to Acts 2. Peter and the apostles on the day of Pentecost tell us exactly who uh, David was speaking of. It wasn't himself. Uh, let's take it up in Acts chapter 2, verse 25. David says of him. Now, the him, of course, is going to be the Christ, the Messiah, as we read on uh, later on in this passage. But David says of him, and then he quotes from uh, 
from Psalm 16. Let's go down to verse 27. Because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You've made, my, uh, made known to me the ways of life. You've made me full of gladness with your presence and so on. But verse 29, brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet, inspired by God of course, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on the throne, notice this, he looked ahead. David didn't have the power, but as a prophet of God, inspired by God, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of who? The resurrection of the Christ that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. And so when we're thinking about prophecies of the resurrection, Jesus' resurrection was prophesied, the Christ's resurrection was prophesied a thousand years before Jesus' ministry. Let's go to Psalm 22 because we have another prediction of the resurrection of Jesus in Psalm 22. Now again in Psalm 22, if we go to the uh, superscription, we have this as a Psalm of David. Uh, verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We won't go through the Psalm today, but there are many places where this Psalm is quoted in the New Testament as being fulfilled in Jesus. But let's go down to verse 15. Part of this prophecy concerning Jesus is when Jesus uh, says, my strength is dried up like a potsherd, my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and notice this, you lay me in the dust of death. So you see, the Christ was going to be laid in the dust of death. The Christ was going to have no special exemption from what all of us are going to face, and that is death, unless Jesus returns before that time. So the same thing for the Christ, he would be laid in the dust of death. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 20 says, all go to the same place, all come from the dust, and all return to the dust. So this one you see would be laid in the dust of death. He would die like the rest of us uh, will do uh, one day. And yet, in this psalm, if you go down to verse 22, Psalm 22 verse 22, it says, I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. This one is raised to life after he dies so that he can meet with the assembly and the brethren, as Hebrews 2 quotes. You see, here again we have another prophecy, another prediction of the resurrection of Christ. Back in verse 18, notice in verse 18, they divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. He was going to die. He wouldn't need his clothes anymore, so they cast lots for them. And yet down in verse 22, here it is, raised from the dead, and he will tell of your name to the brethren, and he will praise you, and so on. Well, that's a thousand years before the time of Jesus, and there are many other prophecies we could look at as well of his resurrection, but let's now skip to about seven year, uh, 700 years before the, uh, the time of the ministry of Jesus. Let's turn to the book of Isaiah, this time Isaiah chapter 1. In Isaiah chapter 1, we read here in verse 1, the vision of Isaiah the son of Amos concerning Judah and Jerusalem, which he saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So we know that puts us about 700 years before the time of Jesus' ministry. Well, let's uh, have a look at part of his prophecy in Isaiah 53. Let's turn to Isaiah 53, and we're not going to read the whole chapter again, uh, but this is a chapter concerning the coming of the servant of the Lord, the Messiah. And if we take it up down in verse 9, Isaiah 53 verse 9, His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet with a rich man in his death. So there's no doubt about this one dying, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. And let's stop there for a moment. A guilt offering, if you know your sacrifices under the Old Testament, the guilt offering was, was slain, was put to death. So if this servant, if this Messiah would render himself as a guilt offering, if he would allow himself to be put to death for sins, read on, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days. Can you see the announcement there? If he dies, 
he'll live on. Here is a prophecy again of his resurrection. Let's continue to read on. And the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong. This one who was going to die, you see, as a guilt offering, would divide the booty with the strong, would be raised victorious. Uh, because he poured himself out to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. You see, prophecies concerning the resurrection were made thousands of, uh, hundreds of years before the coming of Jesus. Uh, we've looked at two in the time of David. We've now looked at one in the time of Isaiah. Let's uh, have a look at more of these uh, during Jesus' own ministry. Let's go to uh, John chapter 2. Early on in Jesus' ministry, he made known the fact that he would rise from the dead. Jesus, of course, knew the scriptures. Jesus knew the plan of God. And Jesus announced early on in John 2 verse 18. Uh, John 2 verse 18, the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and, th and in three days I'll raise it up. Now, they got confused here. The Jews then said it took 46 years to build this temple and you'll raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. He was speaking of the temple of his own body. Destroy it, kill me, and I'll be raised up again in three days. Here again, you see, is another prophecy of resurrection. Let's continue on. Let's go to John chapter 10. In John chapter 10, verse 17, Jesus says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I might take it again. The Father loves me because I'm going to die for the sins of the world and yet be raised up again. <coughs> Verse 18, no one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have the authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it up again. Jesus was going to die, but he was going to rise again. Another prophecy, you see, of his coming resurrection. This commandment I received from my Father, says Jesus. So there's twice that Jesus predicts his own resurrection. Let's have a look at a third occasion in Matthew chapter 12. In Matthew chapter 12, again, Jesus is uh, being questioned by Pharisees and so on, but let's take it up in verse 40. Jesus says there, Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Predicting again, you see, that he would be dead, but only dead for three days before he would rise again from the dead. And while we're in Matthew, there are a lot of places we can go to to see that Jesus made it so clear to his disciples that he would be raised from the dead. I've got a summary here that'll save us turning up some of these passages. Uh, If we have a look here at uh, Matthew 16, 21 to 23. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up the third day. The disciples had it laid, on, laid, it, uh, laid there before them on a plate. We'll see later on this morning that they, they were hard of heart. They didn't understand these things properly, but Jesus made it very clear to them. A little bit later on in Matthew, Matthew chapter 17. While they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him and he will be raised on the third day. Again, you couldn't get words any clearer. And this time we read that they were deeply grieved. Let's keep going in Matthew, down to Matthew chapter 20, verse 17. 
Jesus was about to go up to Jerusalem. He took the 12 disciples aside by themselves and on the way he said to them, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death. They'll hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify. And on the third day, he will be raised up. You see, the disciples were being hammered three times at least there in Matthew as well as the other references we're looking at. The Son of Man will be raised. The Christ will be raised from the dead. Just as the prophecies of old had said, thousands of years, hundreds of years and a thousand years before the time of Jesus, that he would be raised from the dead. While we're in Matthew, let's go to Matthew 17. At the beginning of Matthew chapter 17, Jesus is transfigured, changed before uh, Peter, James and John, I think it was. But notice verse 9. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. There it is again, Jesus hammering the fact that he's going to be risen from the dead. Let's go across to Matthew 26. In Matthew 26, verse 31. Jesus said to them, You'll all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I'll strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered, but after I have been raised, I'll go ahead of you to Galilee. There it is again, time and time and time again. He's told the disciples that he's going to die and after three days rise from the dead. And so as we go back to our outline for this morning, as we're considering, we're considering prophecies of resurrection, then uh, Jesus' resurrection certainly was prophesied. We've only looked at a few of the prophecies, some a thousand years before his ministry, another 700 years before his ministry, and now we've had a look at eight, eight separate prophecies during the ministry of Jesus. And so let's go now on to the second part for this morning. Jesus' resurrection was proven. Jesus' resurrection was proven. We've just considered 11 prophecies altogether of his resurrection. There are more, but we've considered 11 of them. These prophecies were ranging over hundreds of years. So where's the proof? Where's the proof of his resurrection? Well, we don't have a lot of time this morning to go in detail into the proof, but I'm going to put up a summary of the proof. And you can jot down these references or check them later on. But the proof of Jesus' resurrection are the appearances to so many people in so many places over so many days. We're not going to read all of these now, but if you look at the map around Jerusalem, we've got his appearance to Mary Magdalene, John 20. His appearance to the other women around the tomb, Matthew 28. To Peter, Luke 24. To the ten disciples, uh, Luke and John. To the eleven when Thomas eventually turned up, John 20. And uh, at his ascension in Jerusalem, uh, or Mount of Olives, he appeared to them as well. So all of these different appearances in Jerusalem. Then if you look at the map here, we've got a little place called Emmaus. There was a road from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and he met with two disciples on the road to Emmaus after he had risen, Luke chapter 24. If you have a look up here, Galilee, he told them before he died that he would meet them in Galilee. And we find in, uh, in Matthew 28, 16 to 20, they all went up to Galilee and met him there. In John 21, they were by the sea and uh, fishing when he turned up. Uh, he appeared to 500 brethren at one time, 1 Corinthians 15.6. He appeared to James and the Apostles, 1 Corinthians 15.7. And then if we have a look way up here to Damascus, remember Paul was journeying from, uh, uh, on his way to Damascus to, uh, to uh, uh, imprison Christians and harm Christians, and he also saw the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus. Where's the proof for all of these prophecies concerning the resurrection? Well, here's the proof here. All the many and varied witnesses over many weeks who had seen Jesus after he had risen from the dead. And not just in one location, but all over the place, all over the countryside, many, even 500 at one time, had seen Jesus. If you'll open up with me to Acts chapter 1, in addition to all of this, remember what we read here in Acts chapter 1, verse 3. In verse 3 it says, To these 
And if you look back at verse 2, he's talking about the apostles. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by, notice this, many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Now think about that, a period of 40 days. We know that there are, what, seven days in a week, six sevens are 42, so just under six weeks. He was appearing to his disciples in many and varied ways with many convincing proofs for almost six weeks. Is it any wonder when you get to Acts chapter 2 and have a look at verse 32 that Peter and the apostles say in verse 32, this Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. To which we are all witnesses. You see, uh, not only was the resurrection prophesied, but there was ample proof given of the resurrection of Jesus by the many and varied witnesses who testified to his resurrection. And when you think about those witnesses, what transformed them? What made the difference in their lives so that at one stage they didn't understand and they were weak and gathered together with locked doors to other, uh, to later on when they were in the book of Acts uh, described as going into all the countryside preaching Jesus and suffering persecution. What made the difference? Let's have a look at Luke 18 first of all uh, because this describes for us uh, their attitude to begin with. In Luke 18 verse 31 Jesus took the twelve aside and said we're going up to Jerusalem and so on. We've read all of this in Matthew. Uh, he says in verse 33, I'll rise again the third day. But notice verse 34. The disciples understood none of these things. The meaning of this statement was hidden from them and they did not comprehend the things that were said. Now isn't that a slap in the face for the twelve? Look at that, three things there. They understood none. Uh, these things were hidden from them and they didn't comprehend. Now when we see that these things were hidden from them, we shouldn't think Jesus told them these things and then purposely hid it from them so they wouldn't understand it. That would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? Why tell someone uh, something that you're going to hide from them? No, the reason it was hidden from them was because their own hard hearts wouldn't perceive these things. Jesus said later on in Luke, in, uh, in Luke chapter 24, verse 25, you're slow of heart to believe all the prophets had said. The reason these things were hidden was because they were slow of heart. The problem was with them. Jesus had made it amply clear, as we've already seen, that he would rise from the dead, but they didn't understand. These things were hidden from them until when? until they saw Jesus so many times over so many weeks risen from the dead then it all became clear then they understood the people on the road to Emmaus said that their uh, their hearts burned within them where are we Emmaus their hearts burned within them as uh, Jesus was describing the scriptures to them how he was proving about his resurrection and his life and so on from the scriptures that brought about the change in these disciples you see while they were ignorant and the truth was hidden from them before his resurrection, after his resurrection they were changed men. And we only have to see the example of Paul. Now let's turn to Galatians chapter 1. What a change in this man. Remember Paul was on the way to uh, Damascus when he saw the risen Jesus. Then we read in verse, uh, Galatians 1 verse 23, they kept hearing... He who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. How do you explain that? Someone who was so zealous to, uh, to kill Christians, to imprison Christians and so on. Why the change, the complete turnabout? The one who was persecuting is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. The answer, of course, comes in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 1 when Paul says, have I not seen Jesus our Lord? That was the change. Paul saw Jesus on the road to Damascus and he was a changed man from then on. This is the proof that we have, you see, that uh, Jesus did indeed rise from the dead. And so uh, we've got many, many prophecies of the resurrection. We've got the ample proof of Jesus' resurrection. For our third point this morning, Let's remember that our resurrection is also prophesied. Let's turn to John chapter 5. 
In John chapter 5, Jesus says here, John chapter 5, verse 28, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs, and that'll include us one day if Jesus doesn't return before we die. An hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. There's our resurrection prophesied. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life. Those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. All of us are going to be raised from the dead. There's the prophecy. And uh, some of us will be raised to life, eternal life with God. Others will be raised to a resurrection of judgment, eternal punishment, separation from God forever. Over in John chapter 11, Jesus spoke further about these things. John 11 verse 25. In John 11 verse 25, Jesus is talking to Martha and he says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Can you see what Jesus is saying there? Even if you die physically, you will live eternally if you believe in me. Let's read on. Verse 26, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Will never die eternally. <coughs> Those who don't believe in Jesus, of course, will be raised and will die eternally. Will be separated from God forever. But those you see who live and believe in him will never die, never die eternally. Might die physically, but will be raised to never die eternally, to have life eternal. And so uh, just as Jesus' resurrection was prophesied, so our resurrections are also prophesied. And just as Jesus' resurrection was proved, so also our resurrection is proved. And you might say to me, well, hang on, Al, what's going on here? How can our resurrection be proved when we're all sitting here today? None of us have died and been raised from the dead yet, so how can our resurrection already have been proved? Well, let's turn to Acts chapter 17. It was proven for us uh, way back in that first century, as it turns out. In Acts chapter 17, let's read from verse uh, 30, Paul preaching to the, uh, the, the lost... <laughs> Acts 17 verse 30, Therefore having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Now this day of judgment, of course, as we've already read, will involve the resurrection of all the dead to be there, present on that day of judgment. So here's the resurrection now referred to. He'll judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed. Now notice the last part having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. How is it that our resurrection is already proven? It was prophesied, but how is it that it's already proven? Well, our resurrection's already proven because Jesus himself rose from the dead. That's the proof, you see, that he was who he claimed to be and that his words are truth and that our resurrection, which he prophesied, will also take place exactly as he said it will. In fact, if we turn to 1 Corinthians 15, In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12, the question is asked here in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Can you see one of the many problems there at the church in Corinth? Some were saying there's going to be no future resurrection of all people. And Paul has to say, well, look, if Christ is preached as uh, raised from the dead, how can you say there'll be no resurrection? Christ's resurrection, you see, proves our resurrection. Even though it hasn't taken place yet uh, for the world, it will take place because Christ has been raised. And uh, that proves our resurrection as well. Down in verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 15, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who are asleep. He was the first one to rise and never to die again. He is the first fruit, you see, and there will be other fruits after him. The rest of us will follow him uh, on the day of judgment. And so, uh, in conclusion this morning, we talked about some of the prophecies of resurrection. It's an amazing thing to notice that 
hundreds of years, even a thousand years before the time of Jesus, his resurrection was prophesied, 700 years before. And Jesus himself, on eight separate occasions that we noticed this morning, announced his resurrection. And then his resurrection was proven. The many, many witnesses who had seen him in different places over those six weeks proved that he had risen from the dead. The change in the disciples, the Apostle Paul who was going to Damascus to kill Christians suddenly becomes a preacher of the truth. His resurrection was proven. And of course, uh, because he rose from the dead, that means the prophecies of our resurrection have also been proven as well. And so I'd like you uh, this morning, before we finish, to go back to the passage we looked at in Luke 18. Let's have a look again at verse 34. Remember the disciples, before Jesus had risen from the dead, understood none of these things. The statement was hidden from them, and they didn't comprehend them. What are you doing sitting here this morning? Are these things sinking in? Or are you just hearing a loud noise out the front here as I bellow away? We don't want to be like these disciples, you see, who who'd understood none of it, who, who had this hidden from them, who didn't appreciate what was being said. After Jesus rose from the dead, of course, they were changed men. They understood fully. We've got to make sure that we're not sitting here this morning with these things being hidden from us by our own hardness of heart. We've got to understand that these things will take place in the future exactly as God has said, because he alone knows the future and he has proven that he is God by fulfilling prophecies already. The resurrection of ourselves is inevitable. Where will we be on that day of resurrection? Will we be among those who are heading for eternal life or will we be among those who are heading for judgment, eternal destruction? The choice is up to us. We've got to make sure, of course, that we're properly prepared for that day that's coming. And to finish off, let's see how we can be prepared. Let's turn back to Acts chapter 2. We've already read in Acts chapter 2 from verses 31 and 32 that David looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ. We've already looked at that prophecy. Well, the people that were here on the day of Pentecost heard these things and they were convinced that Jesus was the Christ. They believed in him. And if we skip down to verse 36, after Peter says, knowing for certain, verse 37, they said, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptised, verse 38, for the forgiveness of your sins. If we want to be ready for that day of judgment, we need to make sure that we're Christians, we're followers of Jesus, that we've believed in him, repented and been baptised. And as we go on further down in this passage, verse 41, those who received his word were baptised and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Baptism wasn't the end. Baptism was just the beginning of their new lives because if you look at verse 42, they, continually, uh, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. To devote yourselves to the apostles' teaching, you see, is to listen to the teaching of the New Testament, to read it, to understand it, to follow it in your life until that time you die or until that time that Jesus returns. That's how we can be prepared for our resurrections. Believe in Jesus, repent, be baptised, and then continue on faithfully, uh, paying attention to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers and so on. The resurrection is not some fairy story. It's not some fantasy. No one can predict the future as God did, and yet God was able to predict such a marvellous thing. This couldn't have been concocted. People can't concoct a resurrection from the dead. But God was able to raise his son from the dead. And that's the proof for our resurrection. Let's uh, always encourage each other to be ready for that coming resurrection and to remain faithful to Jesus until that day. Let's ask uh, Carl now to lead us in the last song.